Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. They show the same programs, the rock concerts, on television, and it's just like all hell was let loose. In fact, you may not like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because I'm not afraid to speak out. I think the music in hell for eternally be some of this rock music with all its vulgarities and all of its sexual innuendos. And uh, here they were stripping themselves, the fellow running around in a little uh, G-string. It reminds me of the wild man of Gadara in Mark chapter 5 who was possessed of a demon running around in the graveyard, naked and cutting himself with stones and screaming, demon possession, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. You get a dose of the Holy Ghost, filling you, controlling you, and you'll be singing a new song and get rid of all of those stinking rock records. My guests today are Tom Bozier and Rich Beanstalk. Tom is a journalist as well as the co-founder and former editor-in-chief of Revolver Magazine. America's premier hard rock and heavy metal monthly. Bozier has produced and mixed albums for Not A Surf, Guided By Voices, The Juliana Hatfield Three, and many others. Rich Beanstalk is a renowned journalist whose writings have appeared in The New York Times, Rolling Stone, Billboard, Spin, and other publications. He is a former senior editor of Guitar World magazine and executive editor of Guitar Aficionado magazine. He has authored and co-authored several books, among them, Kurt Cobain, Montage of Heck. Bozier and Beanstalk's most recent work, Nothing But a Good Time, The Uncensored History of the 80s Hard Rock Explosion. It is the definitive, no-holds-barred oral history of the 80s hard rock and hair metal, told by the musicians and industry insiders who lived it. And that will be our topic of discussion today. Of Nothing But a Good Time, none other than Poison's lead man, Brett Michaels, says... A backstage pass to the wildest and loudest party in rock history. You'll feel like you were right there with us. And the authors are with us today. Welcome, Tom and Rich. Hello. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. And it's interesting because I mentioned the name of my podcast is History of Go-Go, and this might be the first guest that I've had that even get that <laughs> that connection. Are you sort of referencing the legendary club? Or yes. <laughs> Yes, I am. Yeah. Much of our book happens there, yes. (laughs) Rich and Tom, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have Pantheon Rum Barrel Aged Brown Ale from the Ale Asylum Brewery of Madison, Wisconsin. This selection was actually delivered right to my door, courtesy of a very good friend of mine. So I have to say thank you to Paul. This imperial brown ale is made with seven different types of malt, giving it a rich caramel aroma. The beer is big and bold, just like the glam rock bands of the 1980s, so it is a perfect choice for today's episode. Remember, the best way to enjoy the podcast is with one of our featured brews. I would also like to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. Simply click on the subscribe button on the directory that you use and get new material immediately after it is published. Subscribing is the only way to get those new shows right away. To the ever-expanding list of supporters and listeners from over 60 countries now and hundreds of cities across America, I have to say thank you. And now I raise my Pantheon Imperial Brown Ale very high. And to the power, majesty, and spectacle that was 80s hard rock, and to those that produced it, I say cheers. Tom, I have a first question for you. The book starts out actually setting the stage for this hard rock explosion that will come later, but it doesn't start off that easily for them in the beginning. In fact, there's a chapter in your book called Dinosaur Music. That's how it was received. So would you set the scene, though, in those early days, and why was it so difficult for these bands that we will all come to know later 
to get anywhere in the beginning. I think that there had been a, a heyday for, you know, American hard rock in the 70s bands like Aerosmith, Kiss, Cheap Trick. And even at the sort of tail end of the 70s, Van Halen comes along in Los Angeles and gets signed and becomes very successful. And then what happens, though, is instead of that trend continuing of the sort of signing and marketing of hard rock bands, New Wave comes in. And so actually at the sort of turn of the decade, 1980, 1981, the sort of music establishment, the major labels aren't interested in signing long-haired hard rock bands. They view them as a vestige of the past, as passe, as like you said in the, the, in the introduction, as dinosaurs. When you look at sort of gig flyers from, for example, the Whiskey A Go-Go, at that period, it's mostly the Go-Go's, the Germs, X, punk bands that are, you know, sort of with the Plimsolls, new wave punk bands. And so these hard rock bands are sort of languishing on the outskirts of the mainstream, not able to get record deals, despite the fact that Van, you know, they, they all thought when Van Halen hit big that they were all going to sort of catch the wave. And they'd all been around and at that time in the late 70s as well. Yeah, so that's, the, that's sort of where our story begins, that you've got bands like Quiet Riot on the West Coast who have been around since the mid-70s, struggling to get any form of mainstream recognition. You've got on the East Coast, Twisted Sister, the same thing, although they're playing covers, which also creates a stigma, but struggling to be seen as a, a, a valuable commodity by the major record labels. And then other players who will then surface in later bands, George Lynch from Dokken and stuff like that, they're all around there too. But their music just has not is not seen as marketable. Some of them end up cutting their hair and, and join, you know, George Lynch from Dokken cuts his hair and joins a band called Exciter that is actually much more new wave driven. And so it doesn't, you know, I don't know how far you want me to go, but that's sort of the stage until Quiet Riot through the band Quiet Riot through sort of a weird bargain basement record deal with this like kind of fringy producer who had done one Tina Turner record makes this album Metal Health with the cover of a Slade song, Come On, Feel the Noise. They make this record, basically, the producer, Spencer Proffer, really wants to just, he's heard that Slade song on the radio and says, if I could get an American band to do this, it would be huge. When he approaches Squire Wright, he says, look, I'll record your whole album if you just do this song. So they go and do a whole record. And even he, who has like a deal with Epic, he brings it to Epic Records and they're like, We're, we, this is garbage, we don't want it. This is dinosaur music. And he just basically begs them. Epic ends up putting it out, and lo and behold, between the song, the video, which is, you know, MTV is in its nascency, and this video becomes ubiquitous, and radio support, Quiet Riot's Metal Health knocks synchronicity out of the number one slot on the Billboard album charts, and it becomes this massive crossover hit. So that's the prequel, is what I just gave you. And sort of, we start right there. Yeah, and I remember all of that. You know, it's interesting that, you know, I was just a... I was a Catholic school kid in the Midwest, and that hit me. I loved mental health, right? <laughs> so, right. Who, who didn't, you know? You know, if you could track that type of audience, you're really getting mass appeal. Rich, to face these challenges, though, bands resort to some pretty extreme measures, some lighting themselves on fire, I think, in some of your stories, dabbling in black magic, you know, shocking people to get attention so people would listen to their music. And this, of course, is an oral history. What are some of those ways? When you were interviewing some of these people, did they surprise you with some of the measures that they took to get attention? Well, lighting yourself on fire is always a good way <laughs> to start. Yeah, that'll get attention. You know, it's always a nice shocking. And especially, you know, you're, we're fortunate in this book, we have multiple people who have lit themselves on fire in the, in the quest for fame and fortune. You know, I guess I would say for people that are into this music, it's that, I, I mean, another great thing about this music is it's actually not that shocking to hear that. I mean, we, we know these stories about guys like Nikki Six doing that on stage. I think one of the, the neat things in the book is you also have him talking a little bit about them, you know, practicing it in their crappy apartment, you know, around the corner from the Whiskey Go Go to go back to that. And, you know, just basically shooting lighter fluid at his, you know, knee high boots and just kind of seeing what would happen. But it's indicative of, again, it's what Tom was talking about, too, with this whole DIY, like, do whatever you can sort of aspect. I mean, that starts with the music, but it extends to everything around the music, because you have this time, again, where this stuff is seen as dinosaur music, which 
as a kid growing up then was shocking to me because it seemed like the freshest, newest, most, you know, out there thing you could imagine, although you can obviously see where its antecedents lie. But as far as the outrageous stuff, I mean, you have guys like Nikki lighting himself on fire. You have, I mean, Wasp is a great band to point to in the early days because they're, I mean, they're lighting the the venue on fire, basically. there's uh, <laughs> You go into the Troubadour and we have all these people talking about what it was like to experience Wasp and like feel the flames like rolling off of the ceiling and all this stuff. And the crazy thing about that is that they're doing it in this very DIY way. We have the guitarist, Chris Holmes, talking about how basically they like took apart some barbecue grills and like, you know, just kind of jammed everything together, made this wasp sign that then they would then light on fire. And he's talking about how like the butane, you know, goes up and then the other gas goes down. But like, clearly they really have no idea what the hell they're doing. And the, the Troubadour is a very tiny club. It holds like 300 people and they'll just, the beginning of the show, Blackie Lawless, the singer, would take, you know, they'd light this little torch for him and he'd turn around, light the sign on fire and everything would go up. And I mean, Chris has a funny line, you know, he's like, well, we always had a, a fire extinguisher with us. We're not idiots, <laughs> you know, and you're like, OK, that's something, I guess. But again, for a band like Wasp, that was only the beginning of it, because then they have Blackie Lawless, they, you know, I mean, and they built all of this stuff in a garage, basically. And he has a cod piece with a saw blade attached to it, which he became known for. They were known for throwing raw meat at the audience. They had something called a rack girl, which was basically a girl that was tied to a rack. I think something over her head. Uh, she was topless. Of course. And they would, yeah, and they would pretend to sacrifice her on stage, basically. And we have one of the rack girls in the book talking about it because from, you know, the band's perspective and Chris Holmes's perspective, like this was awesome. Like this is the greatest thing you could do because it was like blood and gore and like, Hey, and you also have a half naked woman on stage with people love from the woman's perspective. It wasn't that awesome. Like she was not that into this. Right. And so it's great to get that other side of it because you don't usually get that from this music. So yeah. So to go back to your original question, you have all these guys and then you have you know, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have Poison making a party out of it and they have Silly String and all this other stuff. And it's very day glow and, you know, this whole other side of it that is like not the mean, scary stuff, but really like we're going to make this a party and you're all invited. And in between that is a whole range of things. But the point being that, yeah, these guys, they were like, OK, labels don't want us. You know, this is not seen as something that is commercially viable we're just going to do it ourselves and we're going to make it a party or we're going to make it something shocking and we're going to make it something more than anything else that you can never forget. And so then just to wrap it back around to Tom's point, when Quiet Riot breakthrough on MTV, it's an amazing thing to see this music get that mainstream appeal. But at the same time, it's also not that shocking because these guys since day one have been doing nothing but performing and doing this look at me thing. And acting like every show, whether it's the Troubadour or the Whiskey or whatever, they're acting like it's Madison Square Garden. So when a visual medium like MTV comes along, like they don't have to adapt to it. Like they're ready to go. Right. And they all, they all go. So Tom, I'm wondering, it, the book focuses on a couple of areas of the country in the beginning. One is, of course, Sunset Strip in Los Angeles. And then, of course, you have like Twisted Sister and then the bands in New Jersey. So you have New York and New Jersey. Covering those different areas, though, was there any difference stylistically between what was developing out west and out east, or were they just simultaneously developing this hard rock sound, or was it stylistically different? Stylistically, it was maybe a little bit different, but I wouldn't say that you could draw, you couldn't make like a list of maybe the you, people always say that the East Coast stuff was harder and grittier because the winters are colder, etc. I don't know if I buy into that. <laughs> but what was happening on the East Coast, particularly until the early to mid 80s, the drinking age was 18. Mm. And there was a thriving cover scene, a club scene. So the, a lot of like Twisted Sister began, they were sort of riding both sides of the fence, but their bread and butter was that they were a cover band for about a decade, mm. you know, playing Bowie, playing UFO, playing whatever the hard rock stuff was. And, you know, D. Snyder, their singer in our book, says that he's done the calculations and adjusted for inflation. He was making, and since he was, they were getting paid cash, he was making like $300,000 a year, 2021 20, money doing this. Wow. So he was a professional musician already. The guys in Kicks, a band from Maryland, they are also 
doing this East Coast cover circuit and making a living doing it. Cinderella before they become Cinderella, I think. Tom Kiefer is in a band called Saints in Hell, who are also, again, you know, these bands are out working, playing this network of clubs on the East Coast and not making original music. So not necessarily on a track to become what they become because it's sort of a dead end, but playing so many shows, five nights a week, five sets a night, just getting their chops up and, you know, it's sort of getting their, honing their skills. And so it's a very different culture. The bands from the East Coast are all working and mostly making a living playing music, whereas the bands on the West Coast are sort of like, don't really have day, I mean, maybe some of them do, but like sort of their MO is they don't really have day jobs. They're hanging out on the strip (laughs) and being supported many by strippers and girls and sort of like scrimping it together. There's no way in the LA scene to sort of make a living playing music. You know, even when Poison in like 83, 84 moves from Mechanicsburg, where they're from, out to the West Coast, they've been playing five nights a week too, playing covers. And they get out there and they're like, well, how the hell are we supposed to do this playing once a month at the Troubadour? (laughs) And so they would actually like sneak out into the inland, like into Covina and stuff, places like that, and play covers to make some money. Because that's what you did on the East Coast. So I think there are different work ethics and different different ways of doing it. I don't think that it was in Nikki Six's mind in LA or a lot of these guys' minds, like that it would be a sort of acceptable way to make a living playing covers where these guys, yeah, on the East Coast, they're just busting their butts and doing it. So definitely different work ethics, different sort of scenes. The Sunset Strip is like this concentrated area. The East Coast guys, it really does stretch from like Virginia up to the top of New Jersey. It's a big area with probably as many bands as just in LA. It's a very different, it's not sort of as incestuous a scene either. Rich, you're an experienced journalist and you covered the music industry for a long time. And in the book, there are a series of discussions where there's animosity between the members of the band. Maybe it's the ego and eventually the money or the drugs and alcohol. The sections on Dawkin in the book come to mind specifically. It seems like they were born just to have that type of tension. In your experience, is there any value to that tension or does it always end up as destructive? I think that there's value to it. You know, even you look at a band like Dawkin, like, was there value there? Maybe, like, I get there's value in the sense that these guys needed each other in order to make it. But Dokken is probably a good example of a band that might have made made it a lot further had there been some cohesion among the guys. I think that you find in a lot of these bands, actually, there's some animosity going on. I think the difference with Dokken is that it was very publicly known. I mean, growing up at this time, and maybe you felt the same way, like you looked at a lot of these bands as like, these guys are like gangs and they're family. And like, even when they're not rocking, they're like spending 24 seven together and they're out partying and this and that, like, we now know this was not always the case. I mean, they were together a lot, but like the guys in Motley Crue were not best friends at the beginning, nor at the end. You know, there are different people within the band that got along better. Um, Brett Michaels and CeCe DeVille always had issues going on. I did not know that in 1986. Like they looked like they were brothers to me. You know, the guys in Guns N' Roses, and clearly we know what's been going on there. So the difference with Dokken is like, it was always part of the story. There's like a famous hit parader cover where it's like Don and George, like back to back with like fake guns, you know, sort of. And it was like playing off of that whole thing. And you didn't see that with other bands. So Dokken, it was definitely very destructive. Um, And you see that in the book that it's there. It's there from day one. And I think that Don and George were just very different people and both very strong willed people. But also like George, again, from day one, hates the fact that band is named Dokken. He thinks that there was some underhandedness. Right. You know, him and Wild McBrown are still in the book accusing Don of kind of stealing their song from their previous band. And Don's like, well, I didn't. And, you know, there's money things. It's like never ending with these guys. And then as time goes on, you know, even the way they function in the studio as a band, it's just like, it's insanity. It's just like ridiculous stuff. that, And they're not like sort of focused eye on the prize. But then the flip side of that is like, okay, well... On some level, though, if they didn't, if they knew right from the beginning, they didn't click personality wise, they still knew that they should be in a band together. Like Don and George still did it and they did it together and they were pretty successful. They were not Motley Crue, but they were, you know, they were touring arenas for the decade and they were having some hits and they were selling some records. So 
at the same time, like they were able to rise above that, but probably not as much as they could have otherwise. And I think you see that to different extents with a lot of these bands. And also the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people going in and out of band. They're, you know, playing with Ozzy or whatever the case may be. And like, so these guys are always looking for the right combination. And if it's not the right combination, like they're going to move on. And so people wind up where they're supposed to be musically. And maybe that's not always the right place for them personality wise, but these guys are smart enough and driven enough to recognize like, okay, this guitarist is going to help me get to the next level or this singer. The last thing I'll say is another obvious example of that is Sebastian Bach joining Skid Row, where there is extreme tension from day one. But he's Sebastian Bach and like the Skid Row, <laughs> the songs are already great. They already have Youth Gone Wild. They already have 18 in Life. Like the songs are incredible, but you put Sebastian Bach in front and have him being the guy singing them. And like, it's just a no brainer. So like they're, they're going to do it. I think, yeah, just to, it's, that's the the thing with the bands that the bands that are in our book be, and are, are therefore the ones who made it. There's a certain ruthlessness and willingness to cope with things like that. That is part of why they succeed. You know, it's not, it's almost like a sports team. You don't, you, you don't have to love, you know, your offensive lineman, but he is the one who's going to protect you. Like these People are ambitious enough and driven enough to really recognize like my daily peace of mind is not necessarily if I want to become signed to Atlantic Records and have Platinum Records, the thing that I should be worrying about, you know, right now. And you see it through and throughout the book, people sort of making these deals with themselves like I will. Yes, I will go with this guy, even though he irritated me the second he walked through the door. (laughs) It, that's in a very adult thing to do, mm-hmm. you know, to deal with people because you know it's in the best interest of yourself and the company or whoever you're dealing with. That kind of leads into the next question. I'm going to start with Motley Crue because Motley Crue has all of these stories. Most people know about them now, documentaries, movies, really crazy, and most of them are probably true. But there was a part in the book which I found kind of striking where they said they were almost always on time. In fact, they were generally early. There's a, I don't know if you can call Motley Crue discipline, but there's a discipline in that that I don't think most people saw because it was overshadowed by all of the partying and excess. I don't think that the PR wings of the labels were thinking that like, the band's work ethic was the best foot to lead forward with to make them sexy, you know? (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) But it's an underlying theme through our book, and I'll get back to Motley Crue, but like for all of the bands in here, the work ethic is crazy. This, You know, they're partying or whatever, but their discipline and their devotion to making it is just astounding. I often say like, you may not, you're not going to read our book maybe and end up being a fan of these bands, but you will respect the amount of work they put into it. And in the case of Motley Crue, you know, Nikki Six is one of the true geniuses of this thing because he's got the whole, anyone you talk to in this book confirms the fact that Nikki Six had the, like the whole arc of Motley Crue in his head from day one. The band members didn't happen to be those band members. You know, he knew like I, this guy and this guy and this guy work. And he knew we're going to do this record like this. And then we're going to do a devil record. So he could do a PowerPoint for you <laughs> of the Motley Crue business plan for, in 1981, you know, and he knew. And, the, and he also, I'm sure, picked guys that he knew, you know, like they're crazy. And Tommy Lee is a nut. But yes, who are still driven by like this primacy of the mission. And that's what you see throughout this book is that like, you know, personal lives, personal health, (laughs) sleep, it really all goes by the wayside. You know, people think like, oh, it's just struggling to make it. But then, you know, the grind of doing a 250 day bus tour, yes, there's partying, but it's, it is, you know, you're working more hours than most people. So there really is a discipline to the people who do this and a grit and it's possible and Rich and I have discussed this frequently, that, I mean, it's not necessarily sane people who make it. If you're somebody who craves balance or, you know, I, I would like to spend 52 hours a week on my band and then I want to go home and hang out with my girlfriend and, and barbecue and walk my dogs. That's not how these people live and that's not how they would succeed. It's not the psychographic is, is, that is required is very specific 
and it is one that is incredibly driven. And that means that, yes, if you have been drinking till four in the morning, but you need to sell 2,000 more tickets at the Omaha arena and be at the radio station, you will do it. Like that is what you do. That is what you are. And it is amazing to see that these people who are, I don't know if I'm allowed, who are sort of marketed as these partying F-ups who, you know, running around with girls are actually on one level, they totally have it together. Yeah. And, it, and it repeats itself. It's like a theme in, in the book. Yeah, I picked that up, definitely. You see that with all these guys who are sort of the top guys. I mean, you see that with the Brett Michaels. You know, you see that with Axel. You even see it You see it with a guy like Stephen Piercy in the early days. Like, I think, because even the, the woman who works the whiskey talks about how, like, he's just going to kind of leapfrog over everyone. And, like, when it, whenever he sees something in his sights, like, he's going to go get it. And, like, that's how these guys make it. And to your point about Motley Crue, like, that was a cool thing to get in the book because it wasn't it wasn't something we were going I, I i would say that i suspected it about them and and tom probably did as well but it's not something we were looking to get people to say but people said it of their own accord like people at electra and the what you're referencing is somebody saying like these guys were crazy but if you need tommy lee at 7 30 a.m because he has to go do a radio station interview, like he's going to be at the door of the hotel at 7.15 and he's ready to go. And then he's going to do that interview and he's going to make the DJ think he's his best friend and like he's going to charm everyone in the room. So these guys worked their butts off. You know, they might go and then burn down the hotel like a couple (laughs) hours later, but like that's all part of it. But it really shows that they're not just out there like partying and picking up women and like, hey, we sold five million records. Who, who would have guessed? They're there to work and they know what it takes. Because again, you know, going back to Tom's, what he was saying at the beginning, this whole DIY thing, like that's what they were doing. Like they, they know what it is to struggle and to hustle. And they're not going to stop doing that just because they've tasted a little success. They just want more. And I think there's a class, I mean, not class, well, maybe a class issue. There's a, there probably are some people that we don't know about in this book. None of the people in these bands, and we say this in our introduction, have a BFA to fall back on or rich parents. This is their way out. This is their, this is what they do. There's no fallback plan. And I think that that puts you in a very different headspace as well. Rich, I was going to ask you about this situation, I guess, specifically in California, where the guys would be sleeping on the floor, sporadic meals, you know, who knows when they'd get their next meal. And the next thing, they're superstardom. That's a mighty jump from that perspective. Mm-hmm. If you make every single good decision, that's still really hard for a 20, 22-year-old kid to do. I don't think it's hardly even fair to expect them not to have excess or not to make poor decisions. It just seems unfair to me. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you have guys, these guys are... 20 years old, some of them are a little bit older, some of them a little bit younger. And they work really hard and they struggle for a while. But in a lot of cases, yeah, when success comes, it comes very quickly. And I think the rat guys, maybe it's Bobby Blotch or the drummer is the one who says, when they put out their first record, Out of the Cellar, which is the one that has Round and Round, which became a big hit. They go out on tour, they do something like 300 tour dates, they're opening for Ozzy, they're playing with Motley, they're doing all this stuff. And he's like, we left on that tour, we came home and we were each millionaires, <laughs> you know, and that was after having nothing. So that's how quickly it could happen. There was a lot of work in between, but it, it, I'm sure there is that feeling. It's like you blink and now all of a sudden here you are and you can buy stuff and people are doing your bidding and giving you drugs and alcohol and, and all that stuff. And again, like you, you might be 21 years old, you know, like, I don't know how you deal with that. In the case of Sebastian Bach, you're maybe 18 or 19. Wow. And everybody knows who you are. I don't think you can expect them to necessarily know how to handle all that. But then the added thing on top of that, besides for the drugs and the alcohol and all that, is that you're also expected to be a wild man. Mm. That's part of the job. And that's actually part of how you get ahead. Like the crazier you are, the more press you're going to get. And like, you know, it certainly didn't hurt a band like Motley Crue and who actually were that crazy, but like acting that way only pushed them even further. Guns N' Roses is the same thing. And, and Sebastian Bach is, again, somebody else who says that because he gets picked on a lot. And the other guys in his band have a lot to say about the fact like he did a lot of very destructive things, um, whether it was throwing that bottle back into the audience and hurting an audience member. And like he wore the shirt that had a homophobic slur on it. You know, these things were not things that he had, you know, they were sort of calculated moves. But 
At the same time, he's like, you know, people got on my case about, about a lot of the trouble I got into. He's like, isn't this what you wanted from me? Like, you know, he was on the cover of Rolling Stone or one of these magazines, like Rock's new bad boy. He's like, what do you expect? You know, it's like, if I didn't do this stuff, then you'd probably be complaining about that too. So, so it really is this really, it's this double-edged sword that they have to, that they have to deal with. And they have to deal with that being extremely young and not, there's no, without any real preparation for how to step into this. And on top of that, not only is there that, but I record records for a living, sort of like not, you know, not, none of which are going to sell a million copies. So it was, it was sort of my beat to interview most of the producers. And you start realizing through them and then listening to the guys in the bands, they're not only 21 and rich now, so overnight rich, but they are generating massive amounts of cash that they are expected to continue to be able to generate. You know, you sell 3 million copies of your first record and then suddenly Atlantic Records entire, that you know, I'm making this up, but the, their entire 1984 fourth quarter will be predicated on your second release, mm. you know? And so your manager's going to know that, your manager's going to be leaning down on you. You're trying to write songs. So, the, you know, there is a lot at stake. You know, it's not just fun and games. There's jobs, there's tours, there's mortgages. Like, there's a lot of money at play. So, you know, there is, on top of everything else, tremendous pressure once you've succeeded because you could be propping up a company or at least that fiscal year for the company. And that, you know, on top of everything else for a 23-year-old is enormous pressure. Now, I graduated in 1989, so I know all of these bands. And I guess, Tom, you can answer this question. But when I heard Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, it sounded different to me. At that point, there were so many bands that sounded very similar. But Guns N' Roses was completely different. Am I wrong in that assessment? I mean, you've covered the music industry almost your entire life. So am I overstating that? I also graduated in 1989, if you're talking about high school. Yes, I am. <laughs> so we were the exact, uh, we were on the same curve. It was different. You know, as a kid, sort of as a music obsessed kid, I was able when there, that record came out to pick up the references were very different. You know, they were referencing Exile on Main Street, Rolling Stones. They're referencing Sex Pistols, Punk Rock. They're referencing the New York Dolls, you know, the cool bits of Aerosmith. They really, it did come out. And in that climate was just like, whoa, this is completely, just not like a total paradigm shift, but a completely different recipe, you know? And their presentation was different. They really did seem dangerous and like a gang. Their look was different. You know, like you're saying, everybody, that was like the apex of the day glow and the really big hair and like the costumes. And suddenly with Guns N' Roses, it's something we've discussed. You know, people always say, oh, Nirvana changed how everybody looked. Really, Guns N' Roses is that paradigm shift. Suddenly all the bands are wearing t-shirts and cowboy boots. And it's because they really, there was a freshness there and a spontaneity, as well as great songs, but also like an actual danger. You know, Axel is a guy who will kick your ass. <laughs> Duff is also a guy who will kick your ass. You know, Slash will kick your ass. And so will Steve, like, and so would Izzy. Like, these are five guys who, if you were to piss them off somewhere, would probably kick your ass. And that, to a kid... When you're looking at this band, it comes off those pictures and out of that record. And you're like, these guys are actual badasses. <laughs> yeah, badasses. And the music backs it up. And I mean, I saw, I won tickets and to the, there was this concert that was on, it seemed infinite rotation on MTV of Guns N' Roses at the Ritz in New York City. And I grew up in New York City and saw that concert. And I was already hip to the band. I had bought the record, et cetera. But that concert, there are probably only been five in my life where even as a 16 year old, or I think I was 16 at the time, was like aware while it was happening. I'm actually getting a little bit goosebumpy <laughs> right now talking about it, where you're actually aware, like I am seeing, this is the real thing. And the real thing is also what makes a band implode after a record, but it was genuine lightning in a bottle. And so it was totally different. So to answer your question in one word, you are not wrong. You're right. <laughs> Would you agree, Rich? Do you think that was the case? Did you yeah. 
receive it the same way or I did. I mean, I would agree. I, I think I received it a little bit differently. Um, I'm a little young. Rich was, was four years old then. <laughs> no, I was, no, but I'll say this when, when appetite came out, I was 11 and I was massively in this world already. Okay. But to me, you know, I don't know that I saw them as that much different, even than like a Motley Crue or anything like that. But I did see them as one of the best. Like I like I was still, you know, massively obsessed with them from seeing the Welcome to the Jungle video on MTV. It didn't hurt to see a guy like Slash, another, you know, curly haired man, like actually on the screen, you know, you didn't you didn't have to have a long straight mane in, in this world to make it. But beyond that, like the, the music was clearly better and it and it did seem more dangerous. I remember feeling that as a kid. But looking at it now, I mean, everything that Tom said is a- absolutely true. And I think, you know, this paradigm shift that you see later on with Nirvana and everything, like it definitely has, it starts with guns, even though they're part of this scene, they change it. And Tom's right, like, you know, 1987, it's still the day glow, you know, sort of poison type of look. Guns N' Roses changes all, all of that. And it's now cool to have your cowboy boots and your ripped jeans and your t-shirts. And as much as it's cool for the viewer to see that, it's probably cool for the band as well, because now they don't have to spend five hours putting on makeup and doing all that. They can just, the way that they're dressing, you know, off stage, they can just roll right onto stage and do that thing. And so you see a lot of the band starting to do that and they follow in the Guns N' Roses mold. So by 1987, well, probably like 88, when really Guns N' Roses are exploding, that's kind of when that whole day glow era of this stuff is ending. And it still hangs around for the rest of the decade, but it's not the main thing. I mean, even Motley Crue and Nikki, as much as he is also sort of a scene leader, he also is very good at sort of sensing when things are shifting. I mean, Motley Crue in 87 puts out girls, 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 and they're wearing denim and leather and posing in front of Harleys. And like, whereas a year earlier, they were doing theater of pain and wearing sort of pink women's panties over, you know, rip spandex and all that. So this shift is happening and Guns N' Roses are certainly the band that is is leading the charge on it. I remember in high school, and I don't know, Tom, I, we did go to high school, to, not the same place, but at the same time. So when I was a freshman, I remembered Bon Jovi being like super cool. By the time I was a senior, we all listened to their music. So it wasn't like we didn't listen to their music, but they weren't cool anymore. Like Guns N' Roses was cool. Bon Jovi wasn't cool. So that was just one change I remember. And what we called the hoods, you know, like the the tougher guys, they would listen to Bon Jovi when I was, say, a freshman or a sophomore. By the time I was a senior, they weren't listening to Bon Jovi anymore. No, and I mean, that's the thing is like Guns N' Roses are hoods. You know what I mean? Like they actually are. Right. Hoods. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Axl Rose is this kid who like probably it kind of got thrown out of high school and comes to L.A. and is working at Tower Records, but sleeping in the stairwell there, you know, and itching for a fight. Izzy Stradlin's like kind of like a, I, he's not actually a drug dealer, but he's like a very loose individual. Like Duff again is this punk kid who comes from Seattle and it's like been in these punk bands. He's the little punk kid. And then Slash threw out our book and then we left some of it out. But like there are multiple instances of Slash, people saying like, yeah, I met Slash because I left my bike in front of like, I'm making this up, but this will sum them all up in front of a comic book store and he tried to steal it. <laughs> like, you know, like, like there are like three instances of Slash trying to steal. So, so he's like this little, I mean, he's a Hollywood kid and he comes from a pretty good family, but he's like a kleptomaniac. They are like a, they're a bunch of delinquents. Borderline criminals. <laughs> yeah, sociopath, delinquent, like however you want to put it, you know. So they are all of those things. They're not, again, you can't, and, and it's the same thing, honestly, with Motley Crue. You know, like Nikki Six is a kid who like, like was, came to LA and was almost homeless. Mick Mars, even though he was older, he was in his 30s when he's being chased for like paternity suits and he's holding his pants up with like duct tape. Like these are like marginal people. <laughs> and I think one connects with that. If you're like, especially quote, quote unquote, the kids who are outside of your high school, like smoking cigarettes on a, on a Camaro, like they, they know like it's aspirational. Like maybe I could actually be like these guys. That is not, you do not look at John Bon Jovi or John Bryan or, Alec John such and go like that dude probably has slashed a tire. <laughs> you know, you just don't. So it's an absolutely different thing. It's a, and it cannot bands have tried and it does not work. It is. I mean, I would say it goes back to, you know, the Rolling Stones, like being like the evil Beatles, 
you know, Keith Richards is the real deal. Like the real deal is the real deal. And I, I know that's a tautology, but that is what the people were tapping into with Guns N' Roses. And that only comes along rarely that 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 kind of person also manages to pull it together and have the best band yeah and i think another you know another point of that which we tried to get across in the book is that a lot of these guys that you don't think are that actually are that as well you know john bon jovi is a relentless dude right yeah you know for him to make it i mean this kid from new jersey and he i mean he he puts that all together all on his own through a lot of different combinations of guys and like, you know, getting studio time at at night and like making this song Runaway, which is a great song actually. And then getting a deal and all that, like he gets to where he is because he's relentless. Brett Michaels and Poison, again, same thing. And you look at these guys, Poison are always the band that are kind of held up as sort of, you know, like the poppy, silly type of thing. But like they got to where they were because they lived in absolute squalor and filth and danger and all this other stuff and like and so you see that with all these bands no matter you know the ones that project the dangerous sort of thing on the outside it's actually real you know whether it's motley Crue or guns and roses all that but even the ones that don't project that like they have a drive and a persistence and a heart that is no different than these guys that also look the part and hopefully that's one of the things that does come through in the book you might not like some of these guys or any of these guys, but you probably couldn't have done what they did, even if you had wanted to. Tom, I'm wondering, we're talking about this masculinity that kind of pervades this whole era, but how about the ladies? Because a few make it, a few make it into that group. It must have been difficult as you were covering it, and you too as, as well, Rich. When you're covering it, do you see women who had a lot of talent who just because of that glass ceiling that's naturally in that ecosystem that they have just blocks them out. In terms of the business, there were a lot of people, I think, who actually managed women who, not a lot, but some who managed to prevail. In terms of the bands, it's a really short list. And I mean, that was one of my beats on the, while doing the interviews for the book is I interviewed everyone who's alive, all of the living members of the band Vixen. And I also interviewed Lita Ford. And it was difficult for them to gain respect you know and with vixen they ended up being an all-female band really primarily because no male band really wanted they were like we're not going to have like a chick in the band (laughs) right or if they did join a band it would be a horrible situation where one of the guys would fall in love with them or something but they in terms of musicianship you know the drummer roxy petrucci had been in another band called madam x before this who had actually had a record deal through Don Arden, who is Sharon Osbourne's father. And she'd been touring like, you know, the, the States in that band for, for years. She's like a hardened, you know, veteran. They had a lot of problems to get with. What they say is it was easy for us to get people down to the shows in Hollywood. Like every celebrity was coming down, like the guys in Kiss, the guys in Motley Crue. Oh, let's check out this band. It's all female. But then when, it, when the rubber really hit the road in terms of getting a record deal, the labels were like, we don't know if we can, like, will girl, but their real concern is, will girls like you? Mm. Because that was the biggest part of the audience. Like, how are we going to do this? Do we have to soften you up? Do we have to make you sound like the Go-Go's? And in the case of Lita Ford, who came a couple years earlier, she had been in the Runaways, who even though now they have a movie and they, they've been sort of celebrated as these rock pioneers, of, you know, were really treated like garbage. Mm. The traditional sort of hard rock setup is, lead guitar, rhythm guitar, so that somebody, you know, it's much easier to have two guitar players, especially if you're the singer. Lita Ford, very deliberately, when she puts out her first solo record, first of all, makes herself look completely outrageous. Like, she's got crazy spiky hair, which was cut by Nikki Six of Molly Crew, by the way, and, like, a, like, weird, like, black leather leotard with, like, fishnets, and I'm describing it, but it's not sexy. It's, like, aggressive. And she made sure that on that record and on that subsequent tour, she was the only guitar player on stage. And the reason she gives in the book is that I knew that if there was a dude in the band with a guitar, he would get all the credit for all the hard stuff. Mm. And that even when they would do TV appearances, even though there were only three people on stage, so she's the only guitar player, there were instances where the cameraman would cut to the bass player at the guitar solo, because clearly if there's a solo happening, it must be the man on stage. So there definitely was discrimination. Then it seems like though these, you know, these, at least in these two instances, once they make it into the big league, they are treated with respect by their peers. Like the bands are opening for Scorpions, Ozzy, like that. There's no, there doesn't seem to be once they're out on the road, really any 
discrimination going on. But I think it's incredibly difficult. I don't think it was a time like now where young men and women are both picking up their guitars at the same time. So there were probably a lot less women trying to make it just because it didn't occur to them that that would be a thing that they could do. But there were definitely issues. And, you know, obviously the culture itself of the videos, you know, was misogynistic. Right. So I'm sure it wasn't easy, but it didn't seem to be impossible. And that's sort of me whitewashing it. And I'll kick it to Rich because he like he says is like, you know, a lot of the people involved on the it sort of business level were female, even on creative things. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we, we spoke with people like Sharon Osbourne, who they have a whole different perspective because, but you know, it, it sort of depends. She also came into the whole thing from a position of power because her dad was powerful. She was estranged from her father, but she came into it from a place of, you know, she was already sort of dominant. So she did not experience any of these things. And she was very open about that. But when people didn't experience it, they also have a tendency to, I don't want to say put blame on the shoulders of the people who did like, and that's why it happened. But they do seem to come at it from a very from a perspective of if you acted like you were powerful, then you would be powerful. But I don't think that that is really the experience that a lot of these people have. Because, and the people in the bands actually you don't have that much power until you're a superstar. And so you see the, the you know, whether it's Vixen or Lita Ford, like they did experience some stuff that of course the guys did not have to go through. Rich, I'll, I'll stick with you. The, uh-huh. the book paints a picture of glam rock explodes. It's burning really hot and then it's gone. And when it's gone, it's like immediately gone. So you got the coolest guys in the world and a few months later, nobody wants anything to do with them. What caused the end of that? I know you wrote a book on Kurt Cobain, and of course you have the rise of the grunge movement and so forth. Is it that simple, or is there more to it than that? It was great to actually really explore that and dig down deep into it. Like, of course, the grunge thing and the Nirvana thing, like, that's real. You know, all the guys, and all the guys in the band, they all, in the bands, they always, like, point to, like, and then Nevermind came out, and that was the end of my career. And, (laughs) you know, that's just sort of a placeholder for a lot of things that were going on, but Nevermind coming out is one of those things. And there was certainly a paradigm shift at that point. But one of the things that a lot of people in the book talk about, which was really great to get into, is that, you know, by 1990, things were already changing in some ways. One, musically, I mean, Fred Curry, the drummer from Cinderella, talks about the fact, he's like, well, you know, at that time, like, truthfully, none of us were, or a lot of us weren't really doing our best work anyway. And he points to whether it's Cinderella or Warren or some of these bands where if you look at the records they were putting out that time, their third record maybe, or sometimes their fourth record, it wasn't the same quality, I guess you could say, as the stuff that really made them famous. On another level, like the bands were starting to look different. You know, I always make the point that like Poison in 1990, when they're putting out Flesh and Blood, don't look like Poison in 1986. They're already like the hair is down. And it's jeans, you know, it's more sort of the Guns N' Roses thing again, but this is also pre-grunge. So like that shift is already happening. And it's sort of this like rock in a hard place thing where it's like, well, they don't sound like Poison in 1986. And maybe some people are upset about that. And yet if they did still sound like Poison in 1986, in 1990, a lot of people wouldn't dig that either. So like there's, there are a lot of these bands are still already trying to figure out, well, how are we going to grow? So that's already happening before the grunge thing comes in. And then, of course, the grunge thing c- comes in. And that's a story that has been told a lot of times. It's told as well in this book. But you add all of that together. And, you know, the, it's, it's a moment that a lot of these bands couldn't come back from, at least for a few decades. And then actually, they all kind of did. Right. It's interesting. The thing that is true, whether it was Nirvana or not, is that there was, to use a modern term, like you were saying, I, this music was canceled you know, and to wrap it up or whatever, but like both, like when I started at Guitar World magazine in 1994, this stuff had just happened. And these guys had been all on the cover one after the other, you know, Nudo Betancourt, Red Beach. But by 1994, it's as it, it, they were not even really mentioned in the magazine. Like it was a total, and the producers who had worked on this stuff, Bo Hill, Michael Wagner, Tom Worman, who had sold millions, tens of millions of records, they were not being hired anymore. So it was an absolute stigma for a decade to have been involved with this music in any way. And that's something that we haven't seen 
that often. I think even people probably who produce disco records were allowed to move on and do something else, you know. But in this case, you just weren't working for at least 10 years. It was it was terrible. You know, it was terrible for them. It actually was pretty good for me because they actually showed up in my hometown. Right. And, you know, we're less than 50,000 people. We're, you know, a small town in Illinois on the Mississippi River. I saw Quiet Riot at a bar in my hometown. Right. I saw Lita Ford. I saw Brett Michaels. I mean, obviously, they had fallen from where they had been before. I could say I saw them, but it certainly wasn't in their heyday. That's the wasteland. Right. Not to speak ill of my hometown, but the reality is if a band is coming here, you're probably at a bar or something like that. Right. And that was, you know, that was tough for them. You know, after playing in an arena, being in a van or whatever and playing in like your dressing rooms, a bathroom and stuff, you know, it was not, it was a very, very big drop off in business. The likes of which we have not seen before since, I don't think. Well, it's good that they're getting a, a rebirth, maybe because of nostalgia. But I appreciate your time today, guys. I really enjoyed the book. Of course, it was very nostalgic for me because I remembered my youth. I remember all those bands. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And, you know, congrats. Thank you. Thanks, to, thanks to our demographic now. This is the new classic rock. That's right. It is. <laughs> it, it really is. So we've, we've made it far enough now that we get to yeah. decree that it is the new classic rock. So. Yes. <laughs> and it is actual history. It is actual history. <laughs> thank you so much for having us. This was a great, yeah. great talk. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. I would like to thank my guests today, Tom Bozier and Rich Beanstalk. And if you would like to get their New York Times best-selling book, Nothing But a Good Time, The Uncensored History of the 80s Hard Rock Explosion, all you have to do is click on the link in the description below. The book is drawn from over 200 new interviews with members of Van Halen, Motley Crue, Poison, Guns N' Roses, Skid Row, Bon Jovi, Rat, Twisted Sister, Winger, Warrant, Cinderella, Quiet Riot, and many, many others as well as Ozzy Osbourne, Lita Ford, and many more. This is the ultimate, uncensored, and often unhinged chronicle of a time where excess and success walked hand in hand, told by the men and women who created a sound and style that came to define an entire musical era. Our featured brew was Pantheon Rum Barrel Aged Imperial Brown Ale, from the Ale Asylum Brewery of Madison, Wisconsin, and a big thank you once again to my friend Paul. If you liked our talk today, please share this episode with a friend. And remember to subscribe to the podcast. Simply hit the subscribe button on the podcast directory that you use and get those new episodes immediately when they're released. Subscribing is the only way to get those new shows right away. For more information on the podcast, like the History of Go-Go Facebook page, and you can check out our YouTube channel as well. The music was provided by the outstanding North Carolina band Bones Fork. And if you want to find out what they have going on, their link is in the description below also. And finally, to our growing list of listeners and supporters from several countries and hundreds of cities across America and the globe, I would like to say thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way with discussions on the history of the impact of hurricanes, D-Day girls just in time for the anniversary of D-Day, when the Irish invaded Canada, and the presidents versus the press. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. They want to try to justify their strobe lights and their weird wild suits and their pink hair and their yellow hair and singing their rock songs and smoke bombs going off as glorifying the Holy Ghost.